Good morning, everybody, and happy Sunday. Uh, if you're watching this, you probably already know, but today, because of inclement weather and dangerous road conditions, our service is just online, so it's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to start today with some announcements, then we will pray and get into worship, and then after that, Pastor Don will bring us the word. If at any point today during our service you need prayer for anything, you can text this phone number on your screen. Uh, you can text pray to that phone number. The phone number will send you a link. You can click on that link, fill out the information, and somebody from our prayer team will be in contact with you later today to pray. If it is your first time joining us for worship today, uh, even though we're online, you can also text that phone number and let us know so that we can connect with you and pray with you today as well. At the end of the month, on January 31st, our church is hosting a Red Cross blood drive. So if you would like to donate blood with the Red Cross, you can go to the Red Cross website and look up Lighthouse Church or Lighthouse Full Gospel Church and you will be able to sign up for an appointment there. Giving blood is by appointment only with the Red Cross. So if you would like to do that on January 31st, uh, make sure you make an appointment with the Red Cross. Our women's life group, Java with Jesus, is starting up again uh, this Tuesday at 7 p.m. And it's every Tuesday. Uh, this life group drinks some coffee and reads the Bible and goes through a Bible study together. Uh, and this session's Bible study is about women of the Bible. It's a 12-week series, so you don't want to miss it. I'm pretty excited for it. And finally, our last announcement is that we will start having refreshments before the service on a Sunday morning so that there can be fellowship and people can hang out and some of the kids can have breakfast because I know some of them are missing that. Uh, we kind of stopped that because of COVID, but Richard is going to start it back up. He is very excited to start it back up. So there will be coffee, tea, donuts, fruit, all that kind of stuff. And that will start next Sunday. One last thing, we are very thankful for your generosity in giving uh, your, in your tithes and your offerings and going above and beyond that. If you would like to give, you can text to give, give online or mail in your tithes and offerings, or you can just wait until next time you're here and put it in the tithes and the offering box by the doors at the back of the worship center. If you're curious about online giving uh, with our church, you can visit lighthousefgcog.org slash give. And on that page, it gives you all the information about all the different ways you can give. Let's pray and head into worship this morning in song and in going into the word with Pastor Don later. Father God, thank you for this opportunity we still have together uh, to gather together through technology. Lord, we thank you for that. Uh, I pray that everyone who is watching the service today uh, can eliminate the distractions around them so that they can still focus on you. Because I know, God, that that can be so hard sometimes to worship from home you know, watching a TV screen, Lord, but I know that we have strength to do that through you, God. And I still just thank you for this opportunity that we have to do that together. God, I pray that today our worship brings you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
let's have a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we just want to give you praise and glory and honor. Lord, we just come to you today. Teach us something new, something that we may have never seen before in your word as we dive into your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're going to continue on with where we left off right before Thanksgiving. Before Thanksgiving, we're going through the whole book of Romans. And now we're going to pick up where we left off. And so just a quick recap on what we were talking about prior to Thanksgiving with the book of Romans. We were going through the first, we went through the first eight chapters. And so in chapter three, we learned that we truly didn't deserve our salvation, rather that we are all under the condemnation of God. And then in chapter four, we know that it is by faith alone, not by keeping the law for our salvation. And then the law was written to let us know what our sins truly are. And in chapters 5 through 7, we learn that we are justified by faith. We have no righteousness of our own, but the righteousness of Christ is given to us. It is credited to our account completely by God's doing. And now we also um, went into chapter 8, and in chapter 8, we see that we face trials to help us um, become, God allows trials to enter our lives so we become closer to God and hopes that we become closer to God to, um, to help us grow more uh, spiritually mature, to um, develop more godly character, to give us hope. And we uh, end it the last time by reading Romans chapter 8, 38 through 39. It says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know what? These are wonderful scriptures. And today, if you want to open your Bibles, we're going to continue with chapter 9, and we're going to do chapters 9, 10, and 11. 9, 10, and 11 addresses something about, well, what's up with the nation of Israel? What about them? They were God's chosen people. But yet it seems like God benched them. That he gave us, he gave salvation to the Gentiles. So, what's going on? These questions were being asked in the Church of Rome, which is why it was being addressed. So, if you have your Bibles, please open up to uh, chapter 9. And what we're going to do is we're going to read the first five verses to start off. And then, like I said, we are just going to quickly go through chapters 9, 10, and 11 and sort of do the, the, the cliff notes of those three chapters. So here we go. Romans chapter 9, the first five verses, it reads as this. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoptions of sons, there's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple of worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So to understand these, the past of the Jewish people, we have to refresh our memory about what happened uh, 4,500 years ago. 4,500 years ago, we go into the area today that defines the nation of Iraq. And we know about the man named Abram. And he lived in a city named Ur. So God called Abram to leave his family and his hometown. And God led them to the Middle East, to the area that is today known as the country of Israel. So God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And God made a special covenant to bless Abraham's descendants. And we all know that he had a son named Isaac, who had twin sons named Jacob and Esau. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and ever since his descendants have been called the Israelites from there on. So this group of people received many wonderful blessings. It says that they had adoption. They had a special relationship of being chosen by God. They had divine glory. They enjoyed the visible presence of God with them, signified by a pillar of fire or a pillar of fire and of also a pillar of a cloud of smoke. They enjoyed covenants. They enjoyed promises of God. They, uh, they would be in a special relationship with God. They had the law. Moses went up to Mount 
Sinai and came back with the commands written by the finger of God. So they had the temple where the people would go worship their God and they had the Messiah, the promised deliverer, sent from God. So the Jews, Jews truly received remarkable blessings from God, but then the Old Testament ends. And it seems like everything changes and focuses on what we read in the New Testament. And so the focus then becomes more on the Gentiles, which are everyone else who are not Jewish. So those people um, have to say that, you know, what is going on? This was a Jewish God, but now Jesus is also for us. So did God give up on the Jewish people? Well, the Apostle Paul addresses this stuff because we have to understand that the Jews truly received remarkable blessings from God. And so the Jews had a misunderstood present. And that's what Paul is trying to help us understand here. And so we can now go to verse 6 of chapter 9 where it says, uh, It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. So Paul asks, did God fail to keep his promises? Paul answers, absolutely not. But we are often misunderstand this about what God is doing in the nation of Israel. The first thing to know is this, that most Jews have stumbled into unbelief. So how does that sound? It sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Most Jews stumbled into unbelief. Why is that? Let's just take a scenario for a football team, right? We have this scenario about a football team. You have a quarterback not having a good day. You have maybe a wide receiver that's not having a good day. Um, um, a cornerback who's not having a good day. So what happens? They get benched, right? So long story short, most Jews stumbled into unbelief. And we read in verses 6 through 9 that we see the lessons of Isaac. Isaac's salvation is not based on birth. It is not as though God's word had failed. So we read this. It says, For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is though Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. So many Jews prided themselves on their, on their ethnicity. They prided themselves on their birth. They prided themselves on their family of origin. They thought that God owed them salvation because they were Jewish. It was owed to them. They were entitled to it. That's how they thought. That's how they felt because that they were Jewish. So it was a faulty thinking. We can call that stinking thinking, right? It's like we're saying, hey, we're entitled to this, that, and the other thing because of whatever. It was stinking thinking on their part. So Paul reminds us that Abraham had other children besides Isaac, but they weren't blessed in the same way. So birth had nothing to do with the blessings of God. So Paul gives another lesson, the lesson of Jacob. That salvation is not based on works. And that two twin sons were born to Isaac, as we know. But Jacob was chosen to receive the greater blessings of God. Did he do anything to earn that blessing? No. He earned, he got that blessing because that's what God said. God determined he would receive the greater blessing before he had done anything. We read in verses 10 through 12, this is not only that, but Rebekah's children had one. And the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. So Paul is very clear here that the Jews are not saved by birth or by works. So how are the Jews saved? We know from the earlier chapters of Romans that the Gentiles are saved by faith and not by works, by not keeping the law. So now we can jump down to verses 30 and 30 through 32. It says, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. So there's the answer. 
the Gentiles were saved by faith, and also are the Jews. The Jews can be saved by faith alone. Amen. So the Jews, but the Jews try to be saved by keeping the Old Testament law. And we talked about that earlier. It doesn't matter how hard you try to keep the law, you're never going to be able to do it. So now we go into chapter 10, verses 2 or 3, where we uh, read that they had great zeal, but they put forth great effort to keep the law, but it was not a wise thing to do. So it says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. So let's now go down here to uh, Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus rebuked the Jewish leaders. And I'm just going to skip through a bunch. I just have them like, written down here. It's not in, in, it's in, in exact um, verse order. So it says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You appear to people as righteous, but the inside of you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? So the Jewish people tried to be saved through their works, but that effort condemned them to hell. This is something we need to keep in mind. They were lost because they failed to accept their Messiah, Jesus. They rejected him. As a matter of fact, he just got finished mentioning earlier that Jesus was the stumbling block. He was the stepping stone. He was the stumbling block. They just, they just could not wrap their heads around the idea that Jesus was the Messiah, that the Messiah had came. So it says in verse 32 that Jesus became that stumbling stone for them. They just could not accept it. So how can the Jews be saved? Only the same way we do, by placing faith in in what Jesus has already done. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we read that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. In chapter 10, verse 4, we see that Christ will make all people, Jews and Gentiles, together. He will make righteous all who believe. Christ is the end of the law, so there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So the day most Jews have stumbled into unbelief. So what does this mean for us? We need to pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. We need to pray that the Jewish people understand that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that the Messiah has come, that he is risen and he has ascended into heaven. And when he comes back, that is the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to pray that the hearts and the, eye, and the spiritual eyes of our Jewish people be open to this fact. So we need to pray for this. So God's purpose has always been to magnify his name, right? That's one of the key purposes of why the Jewish people were given this great covenant promise from God. But the Jews failed to be a light to their world, so they were benched. Well, how do we know that they were given this responsibility? Well, we can just read just a few, a few verses of uh, Scripture right here. It says, Genesis in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we read that the Lord has said to Abram, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In Genesis 18, 18, it says, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Genesis 22, 17 says, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand in the, on the seashore. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Genesis 26, 4 says, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Genesis 20, 14 says, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, 
and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Exodus 19.5 says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So here it is, over and over and over again, God called the Jewish people to be a witness to the greatness and the glory of God to the majesty of God, to the wisdom of God. But the Jewish people were content to just sit back in their synagogues and do nothing and let the rest of the world go to hell. They were being selfish. Just think about that. They were not sharing their God to the other people. They were being selfish. That's why we need to be careful as Christians to not be selfish. We need to go out there and share the good news because us as Gentiles, this has sobering consequences. Well, what do you mean, Don? It says we cannot be proud that God has sidelined the Jews. Unfortunately, in the past, too many Christians, whether denominations or independent or individuals, whatever, actually thinks it, it's pretty funny that, that, that the Jewish people were sidelined. But it's not. We have to understand we have to take all of this seriously. We have to pray for the Jewish people. We have to pray that they come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, just like everyone else. We have to have pure hearts to seek to bear fruit. We need to do our best to share the gospel of, the Lord and, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to those who need to be saved, Jews and Gentiles alike. So we have to ask yourself, why do we exist here in Stroudsburg as a church? Why does the church exist in general? Not just our church, but the church in general, the universal church. Why? God can make rocks cry out his praise, so it's not just for us to gather and worship. We're supposed to do that. We have been created to worship God, but that's just not the whole thing that we're supposed to do. We are here because God has given us a job to do. Each and every one of us, not just the pastor, not just the youth pastor or the children's pastor or the music pastor or the elders or whoever. Every single one who professes Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has this one mandate that we need to follow. And Jesus himself gave us this mandate. And this mandate is known as the Great Commission. We read the Great Commission here in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, where, it's, where, it's 20, where it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So just take a moment to reflect about this. How good of a job are we doing this? How good are we being faithful? Are we being a good, faithful witness to others? So when we consider the Jewish people in the present day, we have to understand that their position is often misunderstood. Not all Jews are true Jews, believing Jews, Jews looking by faith to their Messiah for salvation. So the second thing about this we have to understand is that God used the fall of the Jews to bless the Gentiles. What? What are you trying to say? Well, it's here in Scripture. In chapter uh, 9, verse 20 through through 25, we read that God was patient in dealing with the unbelieving Jews so that he might provide salvation for the Gentiles. Some might say that's not fair, but Paul explains to us in verse 14, What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So what is truly just God to do? Condemn us all to hell? No. We saw in chapters 1 through 3 that we all deserve hell, right? But no, he has given us salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. It is by our faith in Jesus Christ that we are pulled out of that horrible situation of our condemnation to hell. But we do know that sometimes people reject God's mercy and God's grace. Everyone does it at one time or another. Before we said yes to Jesus, we were rejecting him how many times? 
Unfortunately, there are people out there who will keep rejecting him until the very end. There's no difference whether you're Jewish or Gentile. It's the same thing, rejection. So the Jews have a remarkable past. They have a misunderstood present, but we have to also understand that the Jews have an unlimited future. See, the best days are yet to come for the Jewish people. Paul tells us two things about their future. One of them is that the Jews are not completely lost. Let's look at verse 27 of chapter 9. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. So let's just talk a couple minutes about the remnant. <clears throat> what about the remnant? We read about the remnant here. We read about the remnant in, remnant in uh, Revelation. And in 11.1, 1, Paul talks about that he is a Jew who has been saved. He is part of the remnant. So I asked then, did God reject his people? No, he did not reject them. He benched them, but he did not reject them. The remnant are those who come back and say yes to Jesus. They understand, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. So in verse 3 of chapter 11, Paul says that Elijah is proof that God saves the remnant, that the Jews are not completely lost. So in chapter 11, verse 3, it says here, that, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed to the knee, bowed the knee to Baal. So, too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. And if it were, grace would no longer be grace. And so verse 12 of chapter 11 says, But if their transgressions means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? So through their hardness of heart and unbelief, Gentiles received salvation. And now when we go to verse 17 of chapter 11, Paul uses an example of an olive tree. Israel was like an olive tree that stopped bearing olives. So the branches were broken off and the branches of a wild, uncultured olive tree were put there. That is the picture of us, the Gentiles. Okay? And so that became a part of God's plan. And then in verse 23, we see that the branches of the good olive tree are grafted back into the tree. So Israel, again, will be fruitful for God. So we have to remember this as like close. It's very important to understand that Paul is telling us, the Gentiles, that we are privileged to become part of the rich heritage and blessings of the Jewish people. We cannot take this privilege for granted. We must guard ourselves from becoming spiritually prideful, just as the Jewish people had done. Remember, they became prideful. They became selfish. They did not want to share God with other people. And we, as Gentiles, as Gentile believers, the church, we have to understand that if we are not careful, if we're not mindful, we can do the same thing. Become prideful, become selfish, become closed in, get in that Christian bubble and not, and not share the good news with people out there who are hurting and who are lost and who are broken. We cannot do that. We were given that mandate in Matthew 28 to go make disciples of all nations, and that's what we must do. We have to guard ourselves from becoming spiritually prideful. We have to guard our hearts. We have to understand that we as Christians are not superior beings. We are saved by grace through faith. So in conclusion... As I do a rapid fire, here is a Bible study of 9 through 11 of the book of Romans. What does the hope of the restoration of Israel mean to all of us? Well, it teaches us to hold on to hope. God is not through with us. God is not through with Israel. He is not through with any of us. We have to understand that no matter what happens in our life, God is there with us. He never leaves us, and he will never forsake us. He will never abandon us. God still wants to use us 
for his glory and for his glory alone. We may feel like our life, we may have been sidelined with things. Some of us may feel like we've been benched, we've been sidelined, but God wants us back in the game if you feel that way. Wake up, let's get back in the game, and let's play it with excellence. Look for God to lead us and to use us and to direct us in our ways in these next coming days and weeks and months. Don't, don't give up hope. Some of us may be going through situations where we're, we're, we gave up. We feel hopeless, but we have hope in Jesus Christ. We have hope. Don't give up hope because we have to remember that God has great plans for us. It may not be the way that we wanted it. I can sit here and testify that there are certain things that I prayed for, and it was quite obvious that that's not how God wanted it to be done. But I have to hold on to hope knowing that God is going to complete what he wants to have completed within me for his glory, and he's going to do it his way. Because his way is better than my way. It may not feel like that right now, but God's ways are always better. Amen? Amen. So when Paul thinks about God's wonderful plan of salvation, he led us to a doxology of praise to God in Verses 33 and 30 through 36 in chapter 11, it reads as this. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of our God. How unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or has ever given to God that God should repay him. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. What a mighty, mighty faithful God that we serve. He consistently and constantly works out his plan in our lives for his glory. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I ask you to just take that step in faith right here and right now. Let us know. By texting BELIEVE to 272-203-8400 that you said, you know what, I'm going to say yes to Jesus. You just have to do a simple prayer. You can just say, God, forgive me, a sinner. That is just good enough because it is what happens in your heart that matters the most, that you have turned away from your sins, you repented of your sins, and you turn away from your sins, and you're now living for Jesus. And we want to celebrate with you, so that's why I want you to text BELIEVE to that number that I just said, 272-203-8400. That way we can celebrate with you. And if you're out of the area, we want to help you find a good church to be discipled in. Also, if you have any prayer requests that you want to pray about, please use that same number, 272-203-8400, and text PRAY. And we will have someone on our prayer team get a hold of you as soon as we possibly can. May the grace and mercy of God be with you and with you always. And have a blessed week. And we'll see some of you on Wednesday for youth group and adult Bible study. And by God's grace, we will have better weather next Sunday. And we'll all be back in person. God bless. And take care.